the end of the world is on the minds of a lot of people. Signs of the end. People are saying that it's the end of time. The end of the world is near. And most Christians, it seems, are anticipating Matthew 24 to be fulfilled. And thus, any, any event that is abnormal is viewed as heralding the end of the world. Whether it be political upheavals or economic crises or even pandemics like we are experiencing at this time. Outbreaks of new viruses, whether it be wars or lunar eclipse or solar eclipses, meteor showers, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, surges of violence of any kind are all looked upon as signs of the end of the world. We're going to look at how the, the world ended 2,000 years ago, according to the scriptures and um, according to the Bible. So our aim is to, is to have a proper balanced view of what is meant by the end of the world in your Bible. And so we're going to begin by going straight to our notes. And our first point is to ascertain which world is Matthew 24 verse 3 speaking of? Matthew 24 verse 3. And let's go to the Bible and look at that verse. It says, speaking of Jesus and his disciples, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? All right. Famous Bible text for those uh, who, are f who are familiar with uh, or who love uh, Bible prophecy. But I want to let us know that w which world, or I want to ask the question, which world is being spoken of in this verse? You see, there are three Greek words and one English word that has thrown the Christian world into a state of confusion and unbelief. Three Greek words and one English word. Now, that makes, that makes four words, okay? Three English, three Greek, sorry, and one English. That's four words. Now, these four words influence how you understand the Bible and they influence how you view prophecy. These four words influence your relationship with God and how you worship Him. These three Greek words are found in the scriptures and the one English word is found in your Bible, especially if it's a King James Version. Now, you may have noticed that I made a subtle distinction there. I said the three Greek words are found in the scripture, but the one English word is found in your Bible, especially if it's a King James Version. Now, you may ask, well, isn't the Bible and the Scripture the same thing? Not necessarily. The Bible and Scripture are not necessarily the same thing. I want to take us to back to our notes here and look at what I have written here in white. The, the Bible is man's translation and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures. Okay? So you see, the, the Scriptures... <coughs> initially were written in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, in ancient Greek, and in ancient Aramaic. Now, we do not speak these languages today. So, in order for us to read or understand what the scriptures, or what is written in the scriptures, we need them to be translated. And so, we have many different translations of the scriptures into the language in which we speak, which in our case is English. All right. So the scriptures were written by the inspiration of God while the Bible was written by scholarly men. There's a difference. You see, the original scriptures are inspired. The Bible is not. The point I'm making is this that the translators of the Bible were not inspired men. Yes, these men were highly gifted in their ability 
to translate from the Greek and the Aramaic and the Hebrew into English and other languages, but understand that they did so based on their natural ability. All right? So the next thing is that I said that the, 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 the Bibles are interpretations of the Scriptures. This means that when a word was to be translated from the Greek or the Hebrew or the Ar Aramaic into, let's say, English, the translator sometimes had a number of words which he had to choose from. Number of English words which he had to choose from, which he, in his best opinion would adequately give the correct meaning of that original word in its original language. And sometimes there was not even an adequate English word, so he had to substitute a phrase to give the nuance that the original word was giving. So there is a, there is a level of interpretation in your Bible. And that is why if you go from one translation to another, let's say you go from the NIV uh, and compare it to the King James Version and compare that to the American Standard Version, you will see slight or even major differences in the way they have been translated, which tells you they are interpretations. All right? So do, I, want, I want to begin this study with that point. And let's go back to what I said in the beginning about these three Greek words and the one English word. Okay? So let's, 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 let's look at that. The first one is... Oikimeni, the second one is cosmos, and the third one is eon. Now, what is the significance, or what is the relationship between the three Greek words and this one English word? The relationship is very shocking. All three Greek words, which are completely different in their meanings, all three of these Greek words were translated into the one English word, world. So when you open your Bible, your King James Bible, because I'm not too familiar with other Bibles as to if this is necessarily true, but I can tell you for a fact in the King James Version, you open your Bible to the New Testament and look, start reading until you come upon the word world. You are not aware until now most of you were never aware that that word world in the King James Version New Testament has at least three possible meanings. For example, the word, the word oikimeni. The definition of the word oikimeni speaks of land that was inhabited by Israel, both local and foreign. So, at the time that the apostolic of the apostolic ministry, that's the ministry of the apostles, Rome was in control of Jerusalem, Judea, and also Rome was also in control of many of the nations in which Israel had been scattered, which we may call the diaspora or the dispersion. So, Oikimeni referred to wherever the Israelites lived, whether it's in the, in the, in the land of Juru, Judea and in the city of Ju, Ju, Jerusalem, or the different nations in which they were scattered under Roman control. And so the Oikimeni was really referring to the Roman Empire. All right? Now, the word cosmos, that refers to an orderly arrangement or system, whether national or global, in which intelligent beings live and operate by its laws and principles, whether good or evil. And so we even use the word world in this sense. We talk about the fashion world. We talk about the sports world. We talk about even the whole world, which we are talking about the global world, with all its inhabitants, subjects, to, subject to its laws and principles. So, but we can also have segments of the global world, 
like I mentioned, the fashion world, the sports world, the crime world, okay, which they themselves have their own laws and principles that they are governed by, all right? So that's the idea of cosmos. And then the last one, aeon, is equivalent to the English word eon, E-O-N, which uh, designates a period of time, a long period of time, a, an age or an era. Um, and these really, um, these ages and periods of time are, we even use in our, in our language today, we talk about, for example, the Dark Age, or we may talk about the Bronze Age, or the Age of Enlightenment. These are periods of time characterized by some specific or type of activity that lends the name to the age. By you having this uh, lacking understanding, it, there is a huge amount of ignorance as to what the Bible really means when it uses the word world, and that ignorance translates into error in Bible prophecy application and understanding and interpretation, and so God's people, as the, as the, as the prophet says, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So, for example, let's look at Matthew 24, verse 3. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 24, verse 3 in our Bible. All right. When the disciples said to Jesus, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of the coming, of your coming, and of the end of the world, which world were they, which world were they referring to? Were they referring to the Oikimene, the Roman Empire? Were they referring to the global world, as in everybody, all the inhabitants? Or were they referring to a period of time, an age of time, an eon or an era? Which one do you think they were referring to? Now, I'm going to keep you in suspense a little longer. Because I want us to look at biblical examples of the use of these three Greek words, okay? So we go back to our notes and we're going to look at these biblical examples, all right? So let's go back to our notes. Now, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, is an example of the use of the word oikimeni, all right? So let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 1 in our Bibles. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. All right, so let's get our Bible up. And it says there, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, as I said, this is an example of the use of the word oikumeni. And remember, we said the word oikumeni refers to the Roman Empire. And so we now understand that Caesar Augustus was not decreeing that the whole globe and all the nations and all the people living on the globe were to be taxed. No, he was only sending out a decree that the Roman Empire, of which Rome had jurisdiction, was to be taxed. And, and, and of course, Rome did not govern, Rome was not, um, had jurisdiction of all the nations in the world. No, they did not. They just had um, jurisdiction over, I believe, some parts of Northern Africa, some parts of Europe, and some parts of Asia, but not all the nations in the whole world. Okay, So this makes sense that, yes, that all the oikumeni should be taxed. All right? So let's move on. We want to look at the second the second uh, word, cosmos, and we're going to go to Luke 9.25 for the example of that. Luke 9.25, all right? So let's go back to the Bible, and it says there, For what is a man advantaged? What is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself? Or be cast away. And this is an example of the use of the word cosmos. 
And remember, we said the cosmos could refer to the entire, the, the globe, all the inhabitants, or it could refer to a segment of the world who all who have similar are governed by similar um, laws and principles. But in this case, it says the whole world. All right, the whole world. So we know that this is talking about the planet, all everybody in the in all the inhabitants of this globe. Okay, so it says, what is a man advantage if he gain? the whole world if he could get everything in this globe on this planet and lose himself so cosmos is the word used here all right so let's go back and look at now eon so we're going to have two examples first corinthians 2 8 and matthew 12 32 first corinthians 2 8 and matthew 12 32 all right so we're going to jump to first corinthians chapter 2 down to verse 8 and let's see what that says Verse 8, get the Bible. All right, now it says, Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, we need to do some detective work on this. And I'm just going to demonstrate to you how it is you can read the Bible properly and in context because a lot of people do not know how to do this. As simple as it may seem, you need to know how to read your Bible in context because if you don't read your Bible in context, you end up with a lot of strange doctrines. All right? So now, we are talking here, Paul, the inspired apostle Paul, receiving from the Father, which we dealt with last um, study, he received from the Father that there were certain people who crucified the Lord of glory. And we know he is talking here about Israel. Because in the book of Acts, Peter on the day of Pentecost told the Jews plainly that they, the Jews, uh, um, by extension Israel, had crucified or had killed the author of life, speaking of Jesus Christ. So as far as God is concerned, the blame and the responsibility for Jesus' Jesus's death lay squarely on Israel, all right? So we know now, so the persons or the people who crucified the Lord of glory is Israel, all right? Now, he refers to these people as the princes of this world. And remember, we are looking at an example of the word eon. And remember, we saw that eon refers to a period of, of time, an age, or an era. Okay? So let us put in that understanding. So the princes of this age, the princes of this era, okay, have crucified the Lord of glory. Okay? So now, Jesus was crucified in the year 31. The Apostle Paul was writing 24 years later in the year 55 and he, he still says that it is this age. So when Jesus was crucified and when Paul was writing, they were still in the same age. The age had not changed. That's the point I want to make here. Okay, so the age in which Jesus was crucified... Paul says those same rulers or leaders were in the sa in this same age he was writing. So the age which Paul was writing, which was, I said, roughly 24 years later, the age had not changed. Else Paul would have said the rulers of the past age have crucified the Lord of glory. No, he didn't say that. He says the rulers of this age have crucified the Lord of glory. So which means the age had not changed. So let us ask the question, which age or period of time was Christ in when he was crucified? Is only one period of time that could make any kind of sense and that would be the Sinai Covenant age. In the last study, we saw that Christ was crucified in the 
last days of the Sinai covenant. Now Paul is saying that he was crucified in that in this age. And when he says this age, he means the age in which he was writing. Okay? So what age was that? That is the same Sinai covenant age. So that lets us know that when Paul was writing 24 years later, they were still under the Sinai covenant age. All right? Matthew 12, 32. Matthew 12, 32. All right? And the, I'm telling you, you have never heard it like this anywhere. All right? Now, let's look at our Bible. Here's Jesus speaking, and he says, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now notice, Jesus here is speaking of two ages, because remember, we are this, this word world in the King James is actually the, the Greek word eon, which means, as we said, an age, an era, or a period of time. Okay? So, Jesus is, is indicating here two ages. He is saying this age, meaning the age in which he was speaking, and the age to come, which means it's the age following. All right? Now, notice, the, word to, the, 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 the words here, to come, actually are the Greek word melo. And let's look at our lexicon to, to see that. It's the Greek, the Greek word melo, which means about to be, about to do, about to. So it's, it, it carries about to happen, to be imminent or impending. So Jesus was not talking about an age to come thousands of years later. He was speaking at the, an age to come immediately after the Sinai covenant age. So let's go back to the Bible. And let's put in our understanding. So Jesus says, Whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this Sinai covenant age in which he was speaking, neither in the age that comes after the Sinai covenant age. Now which age came after the Sinai covenant age? It was the new covenant age or the, sp the covenant of the spirit age which is now, which we are now living in. You understand? So, understand that when the, when, the, when, the, when the New Testament, when you're reading in your King James Version and you beat in the New Testament, you meet this word world, <laughs> you have to now ask yourself, which one of the Greek words has been used here? 